The poem is called Disorientation. I want to make you dizzy. I want to make you look up into the sky and comprehend, maybe for the first time, the darkness that lies beyond the evanescent wisp of the atmosphere, the endless depths of the cosmos, a desolation by degrees. I want the earth to turn beneath you and knock your balance off, carry you eastward at a thousand miles an hour into the light and the dark and the light again. I want you to watch the earth rising you up to meet the rays of the morning sun. I want the sky to stop you dead in your tracks on your walk home tonight because you happen to glance up and among all the shining pinpricks you recognized one as the light of an alien world. I want you to taste the iron in your blood and see its likeness in the rust-red sands on the long, dry dunes of Mars, born of the same nebular dust that coalesced random flotsam of stellar debris into rocks, oceans, your own beating heart. I want to reach into your consciousness and cast it outward beyond the light of other suns to expand it like the universe, not encroaching on some envelope of emptiness, but growing larger, unfolding inside itself. I want you to see your world from four billion miles away, a tiny glint of blue in the sharp white light of an ordinary star in the darkness, I want you to try to make out the boundaries of your nation from that vantage point and fail. I want you to feel it in your bones, in your breath, when two black holes colliding a billion light years away sends a tremor through space-time that makes every cell in your body stretch and strain. I want to make you nurse nostalgia for the stars long dead, the ones that fused your carbon nuclei, and the ones whose last thermonuclear death throes outshined the entire galaxy to send a single photon into your eye. I want you to live forward but see backward, farther and deeper into the past, because in a relativistic universe, you don't have any other choice. I want the stale billion-year-old starlight of a distant, distant galaxy to be your reward. I want to utterly disorient you and let you navigate back by the stars. I want you to lose yourself and find it again, not just here, but everywhere, in everything. I want you to believe that the universe is a vast, random, uncaring place in which our species, our world, has absolutely no significance. And I want you to believe that the only response is to make our own beauty and meaning and to share it while we can. I want to make you wonder what is out there what dreams may come in waves of radiation across the breadth of the endless expanse? What we may know given time? And what splendors might never ever reach us? I want to make it mean something to you that you are in the cosmos, that you are of the cosmos, that you are born from stardust and to stardust you will return that you are a way for the universe to be in awe of itself. So thank you for letting me come speak here today. I can't believe I came when uh, Ruth and Max were here. I'm so lucky. I'm so happy. Um, my name is Linda Palter. Your theme for discussion is big ideas and big questions. And the big idea I want to talk about today in what might seem a roundabout way is awe. The dictionary says awe is a mixed feeling of reverence, fear, and wonder. It isn't a casual feeling. 
It isn't the, wow, that's awesome, that we say easily and often. Ah, to me, suggests something that doesn't easily fit in our brains. It's a response to something which is bigger or truer or more beautiful or more profound than what we're used to. It's a feeling that people treasure and remember when they experience it. Some people seek and find awe through religion. Some people seek and find awe through science. In fact, scientists do science for the beauty and elegance and awe it reveals, probably more than any other reason. For myself, my training is in the sciences. My undergraduate degree is in environmental resources. That means all the 100 level sciences plus lots of biology, forestry, hydrology, soils, like that. My graduate degree is in chiropractic, which is actually a program very much like medical school. But what fills me with awe, I'm afraid, is quantum physics. No, wait, come back, come back. It's not that bad. It's okay. <laughs> Don't leave yet. It's really cool, in fact. Quantum physics is so awesome that at times it overlaps religion, particularly Buddhism and Taoism. So I want to try to share with you this topic that leaves me sort of speechless and almost unable to focus clearly because that's when you approach what's true and real. And to do this, I will be quoting frequently from both physicists and Buddhist and Taoist masters. So to start, this is what Carl Sagan has to say about our topic. He said, a religion, old or new, that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by conventional religions. Sooner or later, such a religion will emerge. And I think it emerged sooner because I think that Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, was feeling just what Carl Sagan was referring to when he said, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth. So let's see if I can convey the awe I feel from our scientific efforts to understand the universe. It always surprises me that Albert Einstein turned our sense of reality upside down so long ago, in 1905. Before then, scientists thought we learned about our world by observing it. But after that, okay, wait, I need to back up a step. In 1803, Thomas Young proved that light is a wave. That means it has wavelength, amplitude, and frequency. And if science class was long ago and far away, we have teaching aids. So wavelength means the distance between peaks. So a wave can look like this, or it can look like this. Think sound waves or ocean waves. Amplitude is how tall it is, so a wave can look like this, or it can look like this. And frequency can be compared to speed. It's how many of these peaks will pass a specific point in a given time. Okay. In 1905, Albert Einstein proved that light is a particle. That means it has mass, volume, and location. Mass is like weight. Volume is like size and shape, how much space you take up. And uh, location, you can point to it. It's right there. So, totally different qualities. Scientists wanted to see who was right. So this is what happened. If they designed a test to see if light is a wave, 
It was a wave every time. It behaved as only a wave can. If they tested to see if light is a particle, it was a particle every time. It behaved as only a particle can. Sober, serious scientists actually tried to trick a beam of light by setting up one test and then at the very last second switching it for a different test. However, they couldn't fool the light. The light always seemed to know what they were testing for. Frustrated scientists said, okay, light is a particle on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and a wave on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So what is the answer? Well, some scientists say the universe is conscious. Some say there are multiple universes, and every time you observe something, you create other universes with other outcomes. I started by saying that scientists used to think we learn about the world by observing it. Now it appears we create the world by observing it. The Dalai Lama said this, all things first originate in the mind. Things depend more on the mind than on matter. Some say, We'll just never know how light knows whether we're looking for a wave or a particle. And some say light does not have the qualities of a wave or a particle. Those qualities belong to the relationship between the light and the observer. Okay, so now I'm just starting to begin to get that feeling of awe, thinking that my relationship to the universe is part of what brings it into being. Okay, here's another piece of physics mystery. If you heat a gas, it will give off photons, which are little tiny packets of energy. The photons occur in pairs, two identical photons, except they're each spinning in opposite directions. Next, you hit the pair with another particle to make them go flying off in different directions, billiard ball style. Now, if you do something to one of the pair, like make it spin in the other direction, it will affect the other one. It will also reverse its spin, even after they have traveled far apart from each other in space. The information that something happened to one travels instantly to the other. And I mean instantly, not at the speed of light. Instantly. In 1964, J.S. Bell published a mathematical explanation of this called Bell's Theorem. It says all the separate parts of the universe are connected. It's a mathematical proof that nothing is separate. It's all one interconnected whole. Bell's theorem has been called the most profound discovery in science. The Flower Sutra, a Buddhist text, puts it this way. In the heaven of Indra, there is said to be a network of pearls so arranged that if you look at one, you see all the others reflected in it. In the same way, each object in the world is not merely itself, but involves every other object, and in fact is everything else. The oneness of the universe is a fundamental truth that Buddhists, Taoists, and others call enlightenment. When you realize that duality, meaning separations like good and bad, you and I, thus them and us, is just an illusion, you wake up to the truth that everything is connected. So it turns out it is also a fundamental truth of physics. Now pretend we're looking inside an atom. Everyone has seen pictures of atoms, 
looks a bit like a solar system, a nucleus in the center, and electrons orbiting around the nucleus like planets around the sun. But when you look inside an atom, you don't really see the electrons in orbit. There's just this area where you're likely to find an electron at any given time, maybe. Or, as the Japanese Zen master Shunryu Suzuki said, nothing exists but momentarily in its present form and color. One thing flows into another and cannot be grasped. Before the rain stops, we hear a bird. Physicists looked for electrons and they couldn't be grasped. They wanted to know where the electrons were and how fast they were moving. And here's the strange thing. If you measure one thing, you cannot measure the other. Find an electron and you can't tell its momentum. Measure its momentum and you can't know its location. This is called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And it leads to some pretty psychedelic questions. Like, before we measured its momentum, did that electron exist? Did we create it by experimenting on it? And once again, physicists were led to the answer that perhaps we bring the universe into being by interacting with it. In fact, there is not an out there and an in here. There's nothing separate from ourselves. Thich Nhat Hanh, the beloved Vietnamese Buddhist monk, said, we tend to think of the mind as in here and the world is out there. The mind is subjective and the world is objective. But the Buddha taught that mind and object of mind do not exist separately. They inter-are. There is no perceiver without the perceived. Object and subject manifest together. So physics, it turns out, may be the study of the structure of consciousness, much as Buddhism is. So, so far we have light being potentially a wave or a particle, apparently waiting until you look to pick a state of being. And we have electrons that don't exactly exist anywhere until someone looks at them. And no matter how carefully we look, we can only approximately see the electrons, never exactly. The Dalai Lama said, as to their nature, things do not exist in accordance with how they appear. Emptiness is the nature of the object. Because of emptiness, it appears and disappears. So, just how uncertain are we about things in the quantum physics world? Jeffrey Chu is a physicist who did groundbreaking work in the 60s and 70s. When he was asked what would be the greatest breakthrough in science in the next couple of decades, he said, the acceptance of the fact that all our concepts are approximations. I love this statement a lot. Think about it. The most precise and mathematical of the sciences. The people who can measure the diameter of an atom, for goodness sake say the important thing to know is that we really don't know anything for sure. And the Buddhists say it's an illusion. So both the electron that flits in and out of reality and the split personality of light are called wave functions, meaning that potential which isn't manifest until it's observed. Quantum physics actually goes so far as to say 
that this is basically the nature of everything in the universe. That you and I and the community center and the trees are fundamentally potential that manifests in relation to others. The world is not made up of matter. It is made up of interactions. The physicist Frihoff Kopra said, mystical traditions regard consciousness as the primary reality, as the essence of the universe, the ground of all being. And everything else, all forms of matter, and all living things as manifestations of that pure consciousness. So the world described by quantum physics is so much more mysterious than our daily experience of it that I am in awe of the mystery. Now you could argue that we simply don't experience this mysteriousness in our everyday lives. So come on, who cares? I mean, as far as we can tell, matter is matter, and we live in a world of dualities and separateness. All these big, amazing mysteries occur at the scale of subatomic particles, not at the scale of people and trees and buildings. It's not something we experience. It's just something to think about. But the mystics do experience it when they experience enlightenment. Enlightenment is the actual experience of the interconnection and oneness of everything. It's the actual experience of Bell's theorem. And if you have this experience, even just once, even just briefly, that shift in viewpoint called enlightenment will always be true to you. It's nothing more than a shift in viewpoint, but that's everything. There are many paths to enlightenment. Some meditate for years. Some use hallucinogenic drugs to speed up the process. Sometimes a near-death experience will change your perspective. And I, I really wonder if, under, if you really understand all the math and physics behind Bell's theorem, if you experience that as enlightenment too. So when you are truly awed by something, an exceptional sunset, your favorite symphony performed live, the mysteries of science, you can't describe the experience. You start to explain it, and the vibrancy and immediacy of the experience is gone. And you just shrug your shoulders and say, you had to be there. I think that words are these great tools that allow us to think and communicate about all sorts of stuff, like what to make for dinner, and whose fault it is that the car ran out of gas. But they also limit us in a way because we end up only being able to think about what we can say with words. When something goes beyond that, our left brain can't deal with it by itself, and we're forced into an intuitive whole brain experience. Thich Nhat Hanh tells that when the Buddha transmitted our practice to Mahakashyapa, he just picked up a flower, and smiled. Only Maha Kashyapa understood what he meant. No one else got it. A universe in which everything is part of everything else. Everything exists by virtue of relationship to everything else. That takes me out of my left brain every time. When I really think about quantum physics, I have to kind of feel it as much as think it. And I think it's actually important that we get pushed beyond words sometimes. So if you go to church and your feeling about God is so vast and deep that you are speechless, 
I think you're experiencing something valuable. If you go to the Redwood Forest or to the ocean or to the Adirondacks in October and you are moved beyond any ability to describe it, that is profound and important. Or try the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone National Park or a thunderstorm moving across Lake Michigan. Or imagine a universe with every part connected, every part conscious, and every part containing the entire universe in it. Seek awe. Be overwhelmed when you can. And now I would like the Dalai Lama to have the last word here. He said, if these words are helpful for you, then put them into practice. But if they aren't helpful, there's no need for them. <laughs>